Greetings and welcome to Classic of Difficulties, Difficult Questions in Medicine, Acupuncture, and Beyond. I am your host, Dr. James Mohabali. I am a doctor of acupuncture and Chinese medicine, and I will be your armchair philosopher in residence and your tour guide as we try to ask some difficult questions about medicine, health, alternative medicine, and maybe the meaning of life. My goal in this podcast is that by asking and unpacking these tough questions, we will maybe leave with a couple of answers, but we will definitely leave with more questions than we had at the start. This is episode nine. Is it wrong to eat meat? Let's hop right to it. The question today is, should we as human beings, especially as human beings who are trying to be healthy, eat meat? Should we eat flesh? Should we eat animals? Is that a cool thing to do? Or is it really totally not okay at all? There is a lot going on here in this discussion. There are some ecological considerations, like is it sustainable to eat meat? This is a discussion that we are all familiar with, and it's a big reason why this topic is such a big deal and so talked about nowadays. There's also a technological aspect to this discussion too, which goes hand in hand with the sustainability thing. See, for the first time in human history, we have managed to turn humdrum plant products into very, very accurate meat substitutes. Like Impossible Burgers, Beyond Meat, these new highly engineered food products that have taken the food landscape by storm. Even your average plant-based protein shake actually level, represents a level of technological advancement that is unparalleled for the most of human history. But this raises the question, what is the role of technology in the human diet? And what is the role of technology in human health? Should we embrace it or should we reject it? Are we supposed to act like and eat like cavemen, a la the paleo diet? Or is technology just part and parcel of what it means to be a human being? On top of all of that, there are some spiritual considerations to the discussion. Like, is it okay to kill another mammal? And of course, there's the question of straight up physical health. Like, is it healthy or unhealthy to eat meat? Or conversely, is it possible to be healthy on a purely vegetarian or purely vegan type diet? Before we get into this, and before I tell you what I think, I want you to tell me what you think. I know that many of you viewers have put a lot of thought into this issue, and I want to hear from you. Leave a comment down below letting me know whether or not you personally eat meat and why you've made that decision for yourself. When we are dealing with big issues like this, especially when they have tones of moral responsibility and social responsibility, like you should or should not do something, it can be really easy to accidentally focus too much on outward things. Not that there's anything wrong with an outward focus, mind you. An outward focus is part of being a human and an important part of living in the world with other people. It's just that inward and outward are two sides of the same coin. So if we're looking at a problem that seems unresolvable and we've mostly approached it with an outward focus, often we will find the solution we're looking for if we switch to an inward focus. So how do we turn our focus inward? First things first, we ask ourselves, who am I? What am I like? And what do I want to use my body for? This last one is huge. We're talking about purpose and meaning. We're talking about what your life is about. As I have said before, when we talk about health, we're never ever just talking about cold hard facts and biochemistry. These things can be very useful tools for helping to understand the human body and the human form, but in the end we are always talking about human beings. Our goal is the practice of med in the practice of medicine is that human beings function optimally. So this raises the question, what is the function of a human being? What is the goal of a human being? For all of my Aristotle nerds, what is the being at work, staying itself of a human being? What is the meaning behind your life? As you can see, this meat discussion gets pretty deep pretty quick. So let's ask, what are your goals? What do you want your life to be about? And what do you think is important? Are your goals more spiritual goals? Do you want to find some kind of deeper truth in the world? Do you want to find some kind of deeper meaning? Or are your goals more physical, 
Do you want to be physically healthier? Do you want to overcome chronic disease? Do you want to be more athletic? Do you want to lose weight? There's nothing bad about either of these categories, either physical or spiritual. It's just where you're at in your life at a given moment. And usually, these two categories tend to go hand in hand. That is, you really can't work on one without working on the other. It's hard to overcome physical chronic disease without working on the spiritual aspect as well. After all, human life is both physical and spiritual. They are two ends of the same spectrum, and they are both equally valid and necessary to varying degrees at different times in your life. There can be certain consequences that do happen when we focus excessively on the physical alone, and we start to neglect the spiritual, but we will talk more about that later. For now, let's talk about physical stuff first and physical goals. In order to do that, we need to once again return to the foundations of Chinese medicine and talk about yin and yang. How do we understand yin and yang in relation to food? Well, yin is cool and yang is warm, so therefore cold food is yin and hot food is yang. Grilled food is really yang because grills are really, really hot. They're much hotter than your toaster oven. And raw food is the most yin because it hasn't been cooked at all. It hasn't touched any flame at all. So that's the cooking processes that render a food either cold or hot. But what about the foods themselves? We can make a broad generalization about the plant and the animal kingdoms respectively. So yin, as we know, is when things are more stationary, more sedentary, more receptive, more feminine. You could say more substantial and more cooling. Yin, since it's feminine, has some relationship to when things are estrogenic. Think phytoestrogens. Think soy, for example. Yang, on the other hand, is when things move a lot, when they're active and energetic and warm. Yang is masculine, so testosterone is a subset of yang. Plants, in general, are considered yin. From seaweeds to veggies to fruits to nuts to mushrooms. Yes, mushrooms are included in the plant kingdom in Chinese thought. None of these things move very much by themselves. They all kind of stay put, and all of them are, relative to animals, considered to be yin. There are obviously plants that are relatively more yang, and plants that are relatively more yin, but as a whole, the plant kingdom is pretty yin, pretty cooling, pretty estrogenic. On the other hand, animals, they tend to move around, they tend to be warm and energetic. They are all yang relative to plants. Some animals are more yin than other animals. For example, a clam, which lives deep down underwater, will be quite a bit less yang than a monkey, which lives way up in the trees, but as a whole, the plant kingdom is generally young. So what are your goals? Are they yin goals or are they yang goals? Let's talk about yin goals. Maybe you like books. Maybe you're introverted. Maybe you're generally kind of a shut-in. You like to read a lot at home in the dark and are afraid of going out. When you look in the mirror, looking at your introverted self, you might see that you're a little fleshy. Not that per se, although you might be, but just kind of soft, squishy, yin, we would say in Chinese medicine, you have a yin body. Your body is built like the bookworm that you are. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just the natural consequence of spending more time reading books than you do working out. If you've got yin goals, it really only makes sense that you start to look more yin. So what would yang goals be? Well, suppose you're still naturally an introvert, but you are tired of it. You want to be an extrovert now. You want to be the life of the party. You want to be like those fitness models that you see on Instagram. You want your squish body to be a hard body. No squish allowed. You want to lift really heavy stuff. You want to jump really high like a deer or run really fast like a horse. You want to work crazy long hours in the office and be ultra productive the whole time. What's more, when you're done with work, you want to go home and you want to do a bunch of CrossFit afterwards. So how do we facilitate these yang goals? You turn up the yang. So what kind of diet will make you ultra super yang? 
it would be a carnivore diet. That would be a very young diet because remember, animals are young. Animal foods are young foods. So if you eat lots and lots of meat, lots and lots of young, it will develop lots and lots of heat and testosterone, which is what you would need to offset your natural introverted tendencies. To be introverted is to be yin, and to be yin is to be like a plant. You are what you eat. It's a common phrase we all know, and we even have a whole clip on that that is linked above and below. So if you want to be a plant, you should eat plants. If you want to be an animal, then eat animals. By following a heavy-duty carnivore kind of diet, then you can achieve the yang goals and you can become what you want to become. The problems tend to arise when our physical goals are at odds with our diet. Think, for example, vegan bodybuilding. I know it's totally possible for some people, and there's a lot of content out there about how you can still look ultra crazy muscular on a purely vegan diet, but just think about it. The whole reason why that type of content is so popular is because vegan bodybuilding kind of goes against common sense. It goes against what we know. It goes against really the built-in order of nature. At its core, it goes against yin and yang. If the natural order of things is a river, then vegan bodybuilders are always trying to swim upstream. Similarly, if your goal is deep prayer, deep meditation, if you want to be as stationary and calm as possible for the longest amounts of time, then eating a high meat diet would be total sabotage. All that meat would give you lots of explosive energy that you wouldn't know what to do with. As a result, you see a variety of monks the whole world over eating a primarily vegan diet. Orthodox Christian monks, Buddhist monks, Taoist monks, they all eat mostly vegan diets. There is some variation depending on your sect, depending on your location, depending on your time period, but in general, we see a lot of veganism and vegetarianism. At the heart of this discussion is a question about lifestyle and goals. The monastic lifestyle tends to be very, very different than the one that we, as people in the world, tend to be aiming for. In general, in our current society, with the way we do things, most people are just trying to be as young as they possibly can. We need to do this just to keep pace with how rapidly our society is changing and how much it demands from us on a daily basis. Like I said earlier, Yang isn't just for weightlifting and athletic feats, it's also for those long hours at the office and for the fact that when we get home, we often don't even rest then. In the few hours we have left in the day, we try to pursue our hobbies and our activities, the things that give our life a little extra meaning. So this yin-yang thing can also help us understand why things like gluten and phytoestrogens and soy are getting such a bad name nowadays. As a rule, modern people don't want to be yin. We really just want to be as yang as possible. Look at those Buddhist monks. They love gluten. They even make it into a vegan meat substitute, Satan. They love Satan because it makes them yin. It makes them able to sit for long periods of time in meditation. It makes them calm. Gluten does not, however, render these Buddhist monks able to lift weights or to compete in triathlons or even to keep up with a fast-paced, high-intensity workplace. Gluten is actually really bad for that. So there's nothing wrong with either of these diets from a physical perspective, both the yin diet and the yang diet, as long as we work with these diets in accordance with our goals. It's simple, really. The correct diet is the one that allows you to do what you want to do. Immediately, we can see that a lot of people are eating the wrong diet for their body. The cardinal example in a Chinese medicine clinic is one that we see very, very often, especially in urban educated areas. Into the clinic walks a young athletic woman of menstruating age that eats a vegan or a vegetarian diet. She is health conscious. That's part of why she's vegetarian in the first place. That's part of why she exercises. And the fact that she's health conscious is also what brings her into the acupuncture clinic. 
The thing is that recently she hasn't been feeling like herself. She feels a little hollowed out. She's been tired lately, more so than usual. Her hair is getting a little thinner. Her skin is getting a little drier, less lustrous. Maybe she's trying to conceive a baby recently, but she's been having a bit of a hard time. It doesn't seem to be working. She can tell that something is wrong, but she can't put her finger on it. She thinks everything is probably just caused by increased stress at work. But this hollow feeling, this emptiness, it's been building gradually, and it doesn't seem to get any better. From a Chinese medicine perspective, she has blood deficiency. Why? Because she's eating a diet that doesn't match her lifestyle. She needs that deep nourishment from animal foods. Because women, they lose a lot of blood every month with their period, and then after that, they use a lot of blood to rebuild their uterine lining afterwards. Couple that with moderate to high levels of physical activity, moderate to high levels of mental activity from her job, and very easily, the demands start to overwhelm her meager supply of blood. So over time, she develops blood deficiency. What's the solution then? Well, for a long time, women and doctors in China have known about this issue, so they have traditional practices to prevent it. After the period, the time of month when a woman is most depleted, many Chinese women eat a very special soup. It's a chicken soup, but it's made from a very special chicken. It's made from silky chickens, which are famous for their white, fluffy feathers and for their black skin. And underneath that black skin, they have black muscles, black tendons, and even black bones. Because of these unusual physical attributes, the silky chicken is considered to be unusual medically. It's considered to be extra nourishing, and it's nourishing in a very deep and penetrating way. So when women are at their most depleted, it's important to notice that depletion and honor it. And one way of honoring it is by serving women silky chicken soup. And you can see the same type of traditional wisdom about women in the Orthodox Christian Church. People, in general, are supposed to fast in the Orthodox Church. They're supposed to be vegan for certain days of the week and certain time periods in the year. But guess who doesn't fast? Pregnant women and breastfeeding women don't fast. These phases in a woman's life they put extra strain on her body. They put extra strain on the blood supply in particular. And so women need that deep, deep nourishment in order to replenish them. In China, silky chicken soup is often used in these instances too, but there's actually an even better soup, especially for breastfeeding. It might sound a little shocking to Western ears, but I guarantee you it's actually quite good. It's pork foot and peanut soup. And it's usually served with a hard-boiled egg. And it's even better and even stronger if you make the broth of the soup with Chinese medicinal herbs. Trust me, it's a lot tastier than it sounds. But perhaps the biggest depletion in a woman's life really happens in the postpartum period, right after giving birth. And this is compounded by the breastfeeding. At this time, women are so yin, so depleted, so cold, that they absolutely need meat from a Chinese medical perspective. There's a very special practice for this time period that's in Chinese culture and Chinese medicine, and it's called sitting the month or sitting the moon or zuo yuezi, where postpartum women are deeply, deeply cared for and nourished and replenished. This kind of thing isn't just in Chinese culture. It's in Asia. It's in Africa. It's in South America. It's everywhere. It seems to be that in most countries, or at least most traditional cultures, they recognize that women needed to rebuild. So in order to properly sit the month, women need to be put into a situation where they can, be re where they can rebuild. So what do they do? Well, they do nothing. They do nothing at all except eat, sleep, breastfeed, and hang out with their new baby. For most women, it's actually very cozy and very enjoyable once you get used to it. And traditionally, the diet for this period involves lots and lots of meat. 
especially organ meats like liver, kidney, and heart, in order to deeply rebuild her system after pregnancy and birth, both of which take a huge toll on women and their bodies. What's more, during this time period of sitting the month, women are traditionally not supposed to eat any vegetables or fruits at all. See, vegetables and fruits are, in general, considered cooling, so since she's already so cold, so yin, she really needs to avoid them entirely. If you are interested, there are a couple of books on postpartum recovery that I love that are linked in the description down below. Sitting the month makes a huge difference, by the way. We did this for my wife after each of our daughters were born, and she was able to make a tremendous recovery. Our friends, families, and our medical support team were all very impressed with how well she was doing and how healthy she looked in the postpartum period, and it's made a huge difference in the life of our little one as well. We would highly recommend it for any woman that's about to give birth, or even if you're listening to this in the postpartum period, try to do whatever you can. So according to Chinese medicine, there are certain times in life when meat is pretty much indispensable. You need to eat it if you want to be physically healthy. I, I will say, as with anything in Chinese medicine, there is a bit of variation on this point. For example, Buddhists tend to avoid meat, so if your medical lineage comes from a Buddhist tradition, then they might not consider meat to be totally essential. And on the other hand, if your lineage is very Confucian, then you might think that meat is 100% essential. It's actually a very funny medical text. I don't think he intended it to be funny. But it was written by one of the great masters of Chinese medicine, who is a staunch Confucianist. This is uh, Zhang Zihe, and many of his case studies actually involve taking like a sick, emaciated, withered-up Buddhist monk and force-feeding him meat until he's healthy. And then once they're finally healthy, um, since the author is a Confucianist, he makes the Buddhist monk go back and pay respects to their parents and do all of your standard Confucian stuff. Um and as far as Taoism, by the way, in certain sects, you'll often see people, monks in particular, uh, tending to be more vegan and vegetarian. So if your medicine happens to come from a Taoist monk, you might also have a bias towards vegetarianism, depending on the monk, depending on the country they're from. Um, it is very important to mention, however, that in the case of Chinese Buddhism and in the case of these Taoist monks, that their diet tends to incorporate a tremendous amount of superfoods. Like, the Taoist idea of a trail mix involves medicinal herbs that we consider to be deeply blood and jing nourishing, like goji berries and longan fruit. And there's a ton of other superfoods that they incorporate into their diet in high doses so that they're able to stay healthy and have ample blood and chi without eating meat. In order to be physically healthy and be vegan at the same time, it takes a lot of thought and a lot of effort and a lot of the right types of food, if it's even possible. However, a really big question here, since we are talking about Taoist monks and Buddhist monks, is whether we care about physical health. After all, these monks are trying to escape the body. So is the health of your body the most important thing to you? Or do you have other goals, like spiritual goals, for example. All of these monks that we've been talking about, they're not vegetarian for purely physical reasons. They're not vegetarian for their health. They are vegetarian because for some reason or another, it's not part of their spiritual path to eat meat. They find that there's something spiritually better, something spiritually enlivening about being vegetarian, when they're vegetarian, they find themselves more able to pray, more able to meditate, more able to connect with the deeper truth they're seeking, and more able to do all of the things that they want to do. Different traditions have different rationales about why they're vegetarian. Some sects of Buddhism, for example, suggest abstinence from meat for two reasons. The first reason is that they say that you shouldn't take away life. You shouldn't kill. This is called the first precept. The second reason that they give is that you should refrain from anything that clouds the mind, any kind of intoxication. This is called the fifth precept. And this category of the fifth precept includes drugs, alcohol, smoking, and all kinds of things like that. But they also decide to include 
meat in this category. Very interesting. Meat is considered to be an intoxicant. And meat is a type of drug. The Orthodox Christian perspective as to why Orthodox monks abstain from meat is that man was never intended to eat meat. Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden were actually vegetarian. There was no death, there was no killing before the fall of man. These monks, their goal is to become like Adam, to return to paradise, to return to heaven. So they try to eat like Adam, they don't eat any meat. Of course, tied up in this, there is also this element of asceticism, of mortifying the flesh, mortifying the passions, that is, ignoring the urges of our physical body so that we can become a little less physical, a little less earthly. They want their body to become lighter, so to speak, so that they can more easily reach up to heaven. All of this can sound a little abstract to us lay people living in the world. So to clarify, I want to tell you a story. It is a traditional Persian story from the Shahnameh, the Book of Kings. The Shahnameh is a huge epic poem that preserves Persian history, tells the story of the Persian people, and is full of ancient Persian, Persian traditional wisdom. This particular story is about Zahak. The story takes place quite a long time ago. This is before the flood. This is antediluvian. Zahak is an evil king, definitely not a great guy. The way that he ascended to power in the first place was by killing his own dad. Not a cool thing to do. So after he ascends to power, Ahriman appears to him. Ahriman is a little bit like Zoroastrian Satan. A crash course in Zoroastrianism, there's a good deity and there's a bad deity, and they're kind of both equally in charge of the world and they're in constant battle, like against darkness. And Ahriman is the bad deity. So Ahriman appears to Zahak and presents Zahak with many, many days of sumptuous feasts. One after the other, after the other. And what kind of feasts are we talking about here? Well, before this time, the human diet was purely vegetarian. No one, no human had ever tasted meat before. So put yourself in Ahriman's shoes. If you're Satan, and you're really trying to win one of these humans over, what do you feed them? You feed them meat. So Ahriman, basically Satan himself, introduces meat to mankind. He introduces the consumption of flesh. It's not man's idea. It's Satan's idea to eat meat. But once Zahak tastes meat, he loves it. He loves it so much that when all of the feasting is over, he says to Ahriman, because of all this feasting you provided, I will give you whatever you want. Ahriman asks for one thing. He asks to, to kiss Zahak's shoulders. Just one kiss on each shoulder. Seems pretty innocent, right? Well, after he kisses Zahak's shoulder, out of each shoulder grows a giant, scary, black snake. One on each side, coming out of his shoulders. Definitely not an ideal situation. At this point, the hawk does what any reasonable person would try to do, and he tries to cut off the snakes. He tries. He has his doctors try. Uh, he has everyone he knows try. And the snakes, they come off just fine. That's But there's one big problem, and that is that once you cut them off, the snakes just grow right back. They regenerate right there on his shoulders, no matter how many times he cuts them off. So now what? Well, Ariman, who takes many different shapes, shows up as a doctor this time. Zahak asks his opinion, and Dr. Ariman says, Don't even bother trying to cut them off. It's not going to work. The only solution that you have is to placate them. Otherwise, these snakes will turn on you and they will kill you. So how does one go about placating two demonic shoulder snakes? As it happens, Dr. Ariman had the perfect prescription. These snakes, they like a particular kind of stew. And this stew, it has to be made with brains. And not just any brains. These snakes only eat human brains. After all, that's probably why they're on his shoulders. And there needs to be two of them. Two snakes and two brains. 
So every day thereafter, until Zahak is ultimately dethroned, Zahak needs to kill two people. He needs to cut out their brains, and he needs to cook them up in a stew so that he can serve the brains to the snakes that live on his shoulders. And all of this simply happens because Zahak ate meat. All of this happens just because mankind started eating flesh. As we can see, there's a cross-cultural agreement about meat. There really is something spiritually objectionable about eating meat, about killing. I mean, you literally have blood on your hands. But does that mean that we shouldn't do it? Does that mean we shouldn't eat meat and that we should all just be vegetarians? My personal answer, and my answer as a doctor, is no. And in order to understand why, we have to look at childbirth again. Early Chinese traditional beliefs, early Hebrew beliefs, Orthodox Christian beliefs, and I'm sure plenty of other beliefs about the world, uh, through, from the world have a particular view of childbirth. In Chinese terms, childbirth is inauspicious. It's unlucky. Childbirth often implied death, either for the mother or the child, or both. There was a reasonably good chance that somebody in the equation wouldn't make it out alive. We are going to do a whole episode on childbirth later on, by the way. But what's more is that even if both parties managed to make it through the birthing process just fine, there was still a chance that your infant might die in the month after birth. Newborns are extremely vulnerable. Hence, to prevent that, women would sit the month. They would do those postpartum recovery practices that I was talking about earlier. Some scholars argue that these practices have their origin in the fact that in ancient China, these postpartum women were kept in isolation. Just like in Hebrew tradition, they were considered to be unlucky or unclean, and they needed a period of purification after birth. This happened in a separate hut, away from the rest of the village, at least in China, and the hut just had women and their babies. The female caretakers of these women were also allowed in. So often in this hut, at any given time, there were multiple women from the village and multiple babies all in there together. It definitely sounds like a unique and incredible bonding opportunity that would connect these women and their children for the rest of their lives. But like I was saying, this isn't just a practice in China. There's also this period of purification in the Hebrew tradition and in the Orthodox Christian tradition as well. The reason why this purification is needed is because according to the Hebrew and the Orthodox Christian belief, that is that the, cha the pains of childbirth and the mortality associated with childbirth is considered to be a consequence of man's fall from paradise. I'll say that again. The reason why childbirth hurts is because of the fall from Eden. In fact, women's menstrual cycles were thought of in the same way. All of this happens because we're not perfect anymore. We're not like we used to be. We're no longer in the image of God. We face suffering and death in our lives because we are no longer the perfect spiritual beings that we once were. So remember what I said about postpartum women needing to eat meat for their health, and what I said about menstruating women needing to eat meat to sustain their body, especially around their cycle? Well, it's all related. We have to eat meat because our bodies aren't perfect anymore. Our life isn't perfect. Childbirth and menstruation and all of that is a sign that things aren't perfect. Eating meat might not be ideal, but it's really a stopgap measure. It's making up for the fact that we as humans are slowly falling apart. We are slowly dying. We are not what we used to be. We eat meat because there are things in our life that aren't heavenly. Childbirth isn't heavenly. Sex isn't heavenly. That's why monks and nuns don't do it. Nowadays, there's a lot of things that we do that wear down on us, things that 
maybe we just weren't built to do. Just think about how many hours per day we use our eyes, taking in artificial light, staring at our computer monitors and our phones and our TVs. Think about how fast we are now capable of moving with our cars and with our planes. Think about how much we are capable of getting done in a day. There's a whole lot more worldly stuff than there used to be, and as a result, there's a lot less heavenly stuff. There's a lot less time for connecting with your family, for praying, for meditating, for engaging with the beauty of nature, for all of these things that build us up and make us better humans. The world is different now than it used to be, and it's a definite possibility that the way that we have to eat, the way that we have to support ourselves, is entirely different than anything that people have done in the past. This is a really big question nowadays. If people ate bread at every meal, rice three times a day back in the day, then how come when we do that now, we start to see issues with diabetes, obesity, heart disease, and more? There's a lot more that we have to keep up with nowadays, and a lot more that's going on in the world. And that might account for some of these dietary differences. One might argue that the world is more imperfect and more flawed than it ever has been before, and that issue could account for what appears to be an increased need for meat. The more worldly things are, the less heavenly they are, the more we might need meat to fuel it. But alongside this uptick in mental activity and job activity and global interconnectedness alongside the increased demands of life, we also see an uptick in a different kind of activity, physical activity. Exercise is now more intense than it has ever been in the past. Athletic achievement now far exceeds anything that was imaginable for the majority of recorded human history. World records are being broken every day. Think about running the marathon, for example. Here's a little bit of history. The marathon is named after the city of Marathon in Greece. There was a messenger, and during the war between Persia and Greece, he had to run to deliver a message from Athens to Marathon. He had to run 26.2 miles. And what did he do after he delivered the message? Well, he died. Running that distance was generally accepted by the ancient Greeks to be impossible. So impossible that the person who did it would probably die thereafter. So impossible that when you hear this story about this guy, you think to yourself, wow, what a hero he was. Now we have people running marathons like there's nothing to it. Intense physical exercise has become the norm. CrossFit and interval training and things like that were only a few years ago reserved for the most intense of athletes. Now they're common practices. Even the average person nowadays is accomplishing tremendous things, both physically and otherwise. But in order to do these things, in order to fuel our accomplishments, we need to eat more meat. You can't accomplish these championship physical feats without eating a championship diet. But remember, meat and eating meat is inherently spiritually questionable. It's a stopgap measure. So if we are doing something that makes us need to eat more meat, does that mean that we shouldn't do it? That it's bad to do that activity? And I'm not just talking about exercise. It's important to think about that. But I'm also talking about our work life, our mental life. I'm talking about modern life. Across the board, we are achieving things that have never been possible or even imaginable in human history. We are kind of superhumans in a way. But what if, because meat isn't good for us, what if we're not actually becoming superhumans? What if all that worldly achievement isn't what we think it is? What if, instead of becoming superhumans, instead of elevating ourselves, we're actually lowering ourselves and becoming subhumans? It's a big question, and you can really only answer that question for yourself and for your diet. That brings us to the end of this episode on the big question of whether or not you should eat meat. 
in case you zoned out in the middle of the episode. The short answer to that question is, it depends. It depends on your physical health, it depends on your lifestyle, it depends on your physical, mental, and spiritual goals, and above all, it depends on you. We didn't have time to get into the ecological aspect and the technological aspects of meat versus non-meat, but I anticipate that those questions will come up in some episodes in the near future. We have episodes planned for discussing the role of technology in medicine, as well as how man's relationship with nature might under affect our understanding of medicine. So stay tuned for more Classic of Difficulties. As always, keep asking questions and stay difficult. Thank you for listening to this episode of Classic of Difficulties. We hope that you enjoyed our explorations today, and we hope that you'll tune in next time for more difficult questions. If you have any topics you want us to cover, or any awesome health professional you know that you'd like to see us interview, we would love to meet them. So reach out and let us know. Please share this episode with your friends, your family, your co-workers, your enemies, and everyone in between. Your interaction and support helps us keep making the content that we love to make and that you love to listen to.